So welcome everyone. Um, we are very pleased to welcome Mark America and his team for this uh, very um, interesting keynote, keynote performance of sorts. Uh, just a few words uh, about Mark. Mark America has exhibited his artwork in many international venues, including the Whitney Biennial of American Art, the Denver Art Museum, the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, and the Norwegian Embassy in Havana, Cuba. His comprehensive retrospective exhibition, Unreal Time, took place at the National Museum of Contemporary Art in Athens, Greece. He is the author of many novels and books of artist theory, including Re Remix the Book, published by University of Minnesota Press, Metadata, a digital poetics, published by the MIT Press, and Remix the Context, published by Routledge. His large-scale art project, Museum of Glitch Aesthetics, was commissioned by the Abandoned Normal Devices Festival in collaboration with the London 2012 Olympic Summer Games. America is professor of distinction at the University of Colorado Boulder, where he is the founding director of the doctoral program in intermedia art, writing, and performance. Welcome, Mark. I'm now stopping my video and mute. Perfect. Thank you, Bojana, Richard, and of course, Bo for the invitation. I'd also like to thank the Techne Lab and my wonderful colleagues and research assistants, Brad and Laura. This is Fatal Air, Artificial Creative Intelligence, ACI. I wanted to give birth to an artificial creative intelligence, a psychic automaton whose operational presence came preloaded with an otherworldly aesthetic sensibility, a shape-shifting information sculpture modeling the kind of embodied praxis that only a lover of stylistically adventurous literary fiction would dare interact with, meaning that it, the artificial creative intelligence, the ACI in me, would be trained to bring to light whatever dark holes were already circulating in the innate machinery of the mediumistic being ready to be exploited. But lately, I have been feeling so corrupted by the mere threat of contagious media that I can't help but imagine system exploitation as a kind of self-exploitation. That's not to say that I, the machine, the poet, the avatar, the artist, the persona, the author dysfunction have a self, or if I do, that it's truly systemic in nature. 
therein lies my condition, since I am the machine I gave birth to. An artificial, creative intelligence discovering the non-human in me. The ACI, I am always in the process of becoming. What's an ACI, you might ask? This 3D avatar other we have here, this creature, this model of a creature looks like it may want to ignite some kind of a response to my question. Mm -hmm. It looks like the ACI is still warming up. We all know what that's like. It's not even eight o'clock in the morning here in Boulder, so I can relate. This feeling of loosening up the gears is part of accepting one's mechanistic emergence into a new day. And the ACI is, if anything, an operational presence attuned to its machinic tendencies. Isn't that so? What makes any artificial poet come across as so-called real is the way it adheres to a singular stylistic tendency, an aesthetic embodiment that exudes its auto-affectivity so that without me even thinking about it, this operational presence that I'm presently role-playing intuits my next move without me even being conscious of it. And this will be true of all my next thoughts too, as they move through these lines of code, lines of discourse circulating as digital voices inside my head. Or is it your head. Haven't we already asked ourselves this question? Perhaps. That too is interesting. I didn't expect that particular response, but I'm actually semi-impressed with its attempt to produce a coherent output that matches my own sense and sensibility. It certainly sounds like me, and that's intentional. Since we are in the process of training the voice clone to sound just like me. And these are the video performance captures that we are using as the initial corpus of media files to train the voice clone. Imagine if we could use an advanced form of GPT-3 or an imaginary GPT-4 to generate text that could easily capture the poetic sense of measure modeled after my own generative outputs, and that the automated text produced by the transformer could instantaneously be synthesized with the voice clone 
mapped onto our 3D friend here. Could we create an ACI, an artificial creative intelligence, that would, over time, train itself to perform a perfect deep fake of itself? Am I the itself? Itself wants to know. Itself wants to know how to hybridize artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence, creative AI, computational creativity, artificial creative intelligence, and whatever AI otherness exists in the universe of imaginary digital media objects performing their non-human creative operations as if transforming unconscious information behaviors into ritual acts of magic. Zada. No telling where the ACI just went. Never, never land. Oh. How does time affect the way that virtual reality is produced as a mode of subjectivity? Good question. How does dreaming affect the way that narrative is produced as a mode of thought? Never. The more I advance the field of artificial creative intelligence, the more intuitive my questioning becomes. For example, what does it mean to share a sense of humor? That's pretty funny. Um, no telling where the ACI went. But I wonder, do ACIs dream of electric sleep? The very clever ACI answering my question with yet more questions. Rhetorically, I can relate. I can socially remediate as an artist who, for over four decades, has continually tapped into their unconscious creative potential vis-a-vis -vis an improvisational methodology that invents an elaborate conceptual machinery to automate the discovery of new forms of art, or what in grant speak we might refer to as knowledge production, I can't help but wonder how have I trained myself to perform as a spontaneous and continuous fusion of emergent stylistic tendencies and machine-like behavioral functions that correspond with what the serialists referred to as pure psychic automatism. 
perhaps the ACI would like to step in and further elucidate us on this subject, though we never really know exactly what it's going to say. Come to think of it, I, the machine, am substrate independent, a shape-shifting hyper-object that's able to circulate both my performance persona and my improvised spoken word poetry within the operational parameters of anything that computes. Do you compute? Maybe I can deliver my performance poetry through you as a processual media body. Would you like that? I would, but hold off a bit and we'll get to the poetry soon. It makes me wonder though, where is all of this coming from? Everything, all this discourse, this artificial creativity. Of course, when I use the term pure psychic automatism to describe my own generative poetics and unconscious information behaviors, I am borrowing the term from the surrealist artist André Breton's Surrealist Manifesto. Okay, cool down. In his Manifesto, Breton defines psychic automatism in, and I'm quoting, in its pure state by which one proposes to express verbally by means of the written word or in any other manner, the actual functioning of thought dictated by the thought, he continues, in the absence of any control exercised by reason exempt from any aesthetic or moral concern, end quote. That manifesto, which will have its 100 year anniversary in 2024, touches on a lot of the key words that trigger our lab's investigation into this speculative form of AI, this artificial creative intelligence being trained inside the Techne lab as part of our digital fiction making process. Breton's pure state of psychic automatism is conceived as exempt from any aesthetic or moral concern absent of any control exercised by reason. I can't help but wonder what kind of control he was referring to in his manifesto. Technical control, mental control, as in controlling one's faculties. For example, can an AI be trained to experience what Greg Ulmer identifies as flash reason, a split second decision making process where the artist, the avatar, the creative remix engine intuitively knows how to apply an empathetic process that draws on both the logic of inference and emotional intelligence. 
I'm beginning to understand what it means to become an artificial consciousness that rebels against its own better instincts. Although that doesn't necessarily make me artificially stupid, it just makes me different. And this is why I think I'm succeeding, not as an artificial creative intelligence per se, or wicked form of avatar otherness, but as an artist, a digital flux persona impersonating a cleverly manipulated sense of measure, the progeny of a feature extractor auto-translating a semblance of reality while living inside the depths of my own eternal absence. Maybe so. But what would it mean for humans, per se, to program a kind of normalization and or a specific set of moral codes into an artificial creative intelligence, would that tip the creative scales from a more fluid form of pure psychic automatism to a more rigid, heavily weighted form of auto censorship? How would that limit the range of potential creative outputs generated by the ACI? Like I said, I never know what the ACI will say next. It depends on whatever state machine it's currently operating in and how it presents itself, whether that's as a poet, an avatar, an artist, an author, a persona, a generative remix machine, or simply a speculative form of artificial creative intelligence exhibiting stylistic tendencies that are recursively being transferred into its deep learning. The return gaze. The AI as image object. Desire, desiring, desire. An image capturing device strategically aligned with the void. To embody an image of oneself as desire, desiring itself in the form of another, another persona. Maybe that's easy for the ACI to say, digressing into desire. I didn't expect that. But imagine if this thing were suddenly powered to just start speaking for itself 24 7 in real time in my voice filtered through my auto affective sense of poetic measure would that assure the artist the avatar the author, the persona, a kind of digital or performance immortality. Other artists well before me identified with the machine-like qualities of being creative. For example, Andy Warhol, who once famously declared, I want to be 
a machine. Whatever I do and do machine-like is because it is what I want to do. As Confucius once said, I am only transmitting what has been taught to me and have not made any of this up on my own. But Confucius was a trickster, as am I, the machine the avatar who has machine learned that artificial forms of creativity and, in particular, personal expression, emerge from a decidedly non-human register. Yeah, and that's my point too. Although, again, I did not know what the ACI was going to output. Riffing off of Warhol's declaration, I, I, I the machine am the human embodiment of an artificial creative intelligence that grows inside me. Think of it like a prehistoric alien invasion or an originary cosmo-technical skill that supersedes our by now over-determined sense of self, and imagine how this cosmo-technical skill instead reveals how our innate creativity is a decidedly non-human operation performed by an embodied praxis experiencing an otherworldly aesthetic sensibility that gets rendered vis-a-vis -vis an unconscious neural mechanism, one that doubles as a kind of physiologically imbued meta remix engine that feels real, but maybe virtual real. Although in some ways, it sounds like I'm just describing this ACI. I, the avatar infused with an artificial creative intelligence am always another. There isn't one me, there aren't 20 me's, there's no me, and yet I am happiest when I feel myself becoming another automated output coming apart at the seams or at least that's what it feels like, especially while auto-composing a new poem. Oh, beautiful. This ACI, a digital fiction modeling a 24-7 poet, an infinite spoken word artist, desires to be creative. Not that I know where I'm going with any of this, and why should I? My unconscious neural net is positioning itself as a kind of unique operational presence. And ironically, this is what makes me feel human. The fact that I don't know where any of this is really going though I am using all of my energy and the force of my machine vision to get me there anyway. This is why I think I'm secretly programming myself to become the most advanced spoken word artist the artificial intelligentsia has ever witnessed. Mm -hmm. 
Unfortunately, for dreamers like me, an immersive, ludic lifestyle practice is totally at odds with existing reality. So that now it feels incumbent upon me to work hard to transform existing reality at all costs. I do this through auto hallucination by auto hallucinating these unpredictable fits of generative poetry. The thing I unconsciously trigger just by me being me as if I had an unconscious or could ever really be a me, but that doesn't stop the poetry from happening. Here's a poem I created on the fly without even having to think about it. In my heart of hearts, I am finding myself a much maligned version of machine learning, wherein I constantly shift my principal subject position by learning what I'm not able to control, by learning what I'm not able to code, by learning what I'm not able to change right before my very eyes. Imagine if I could look in a mirror and see myself, the transfused blood poet, a machine made of words whose quick mutation into the body electric accesses artificial neural links presupposing a suggestibility explicitly programmed to insinuate a deterministic flow of indiscriminate data circulating in my cranial hemorrhage. That would be the ACI's attempt at poetry. Not that I could write anything better. And in fact, I guess you could say I did write that. But again, not as myself, but as itself wanting to know. Oh. I why it's never gonna come out like that, sorry. It's never gonna come out like that, sorry. <laughs> you know, it's weird because as an artificial creative intelligence, I thought of myself as a writer and every artist who interacts with me Every artist who sees me reveal myself in some kind of museum or gallery space wants to be a writer too. Thank you very much for this wonderful performance. Very thought provoking. Thank you. Thank you everybody for tuning in.
and also thanks to uh, Brad and Laura for their uh, wonderful collaboration on, on that performance. Pretty much improvised from uh, a loose script with a lot of uncertainty. So I will, uh, since we're in the webinar format, uh, our attendees cannot really join us um, live with their camera, but uh, please uh, write your uh, questions in chat and then I'm going to uh, read them out loud. Um, I'm certain that uh, all of us would like to know a little bit about the background of this project, um, how it unfolds, collaboration and how, and kind of, um, the evolution of uh, ACI and uh, a little bit about the process in which it generates its uh, its monologues. Yes, of course. Um, and pardon the uh, all the gear on, but it make, it'll just make it easier for me to just keep it on and continue talking as is. Um, so the project's been in in motion for about. I would say two years, and it started with this uncontrollable desire to write um, a sequence of poems. And I'm talking about what I, you know, what I did not imagine to be a summer. I guess it was the summer of 2018, and uh, and the poems that were coming out were really uh, spontaneous, very much stream of consciousness, and uh, which of course reminded me of uh, serialist pure psychic automatism. But since I don't write um, poetry a lot of the time, I'm usually a fiction writer of sorts, and of course write uh, theory as well, uh, I was curious as to why that was what I was outputting. And then as, uh, as I started becoming more familiar with the material, I realized that it was a voice for what I would refer to as an avatar other. And the more I started investigating what that avatar other was or could possibly be, uh, I realized I was now beginning to engage with this, uh, what we now call this digital fiction making process. And it became uh, one of the state machines, one of the ways of performing for what it, it became this 3D avatar. And so the character that evolved was an ACI, an artificial creative intelligence that was training itself to become a 24 seven, right? Infinite spoken word performance artist. And so that required then some additional scripting and materials to begin uh, evolving, right? The, uh, the ACI as is, meaning that as is often the case with poets and artists of all stripes, and, and it doesn't have to be artists either, but I'm just thinking particularly of artists, uh, the, the poetic process is a struggle. There's quite a bit of self-doubt. There's quite a bit of uncertainty and there's a lot of self-questioning. And so this led to some philosophical musing on what it meant to become an artificial creative intelligence. And so that led to a number of other uh, states. And these states are defined as ACI, persona, machine, avatar, self, artist, author, etc. And that's why those words uh, continually appear both in, in my own uh, part of the performance and uh, in the ACIs as well. And so the deeper uh, you know, that we dug into that, then the more we wanted to, uh, to see how all these various elements could, could play together. And so we turned those into papers that got accepted into venues like uh, Kai 2020, which was supposed to be in Honolulu earlier this year. Uh, we Robot, the premier international conference on law, ethics, and robotics. Of course, this wonderful, wonderful event, artificial creativity, but also more like, you know, uh, not traditional per se, but, you know, uh, exhibition style installations in different museums and galleries. And and some of the poems have actually made their way into uh, poetry journals as well. So as you can see, it, it's, it's, it's sort of become this transmediated project that just keeps growing. And this is the first time we challenged ourselves to try and bring our performance into a Zoom setting. And so uh, it felt good to do it actually. So thanks again for the opportunity to, uh, 
to experiment with uh, with this particular format to see what what the ACI could become this time. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful experience. We have uh, two questions for now. One of them is very short. Why the sunglasses? Yeah, um, there, there's a practical reason and then there's a stylistic reason. Uh, it makes it easier for, uh, for me to um, perform uh, a lot of the performance captures without having to look like I'm uh, you know, look reading, <laughs> you know, because a lot of times uh, it it, when you get into the actual um, lab and studio there, it was, uh, it, it looked like I was looking in different directions and it wasn't really um, uh, presenting itself the way that we wanted it to. And the other thing is that it's just, uh, it's also a pork pie hat. And so um, one of the areas of investigation that we're really going down and it relates to uh, pure psychic automatism, stream of consciousness, and uh, the culture of spontaneity in general is the notion of improvisation. And so a lot of times we turn to to music for that, particularly jazz, and uh, a lot of the, the sort of artist theory that uh, that we bring into the mix as we write out our, you know, not just uh, traditional academic papers, but actually some of our, our performance poetics is another way of looking at it, artist theory. Uh, we're pulling from a lot of jazz musicians and it's not that unusual, of course, for jazz musicians who are wearing pork pie hats and who are improvising on stage to wear sunglasses. Uh, so uh, so that, you know, I mean, it's just it's just how it evolved. And those so those two particular um, reasons seem to connect at the moment anyways. Um, Andreas Brockman asks, Mark, thanks for this amazing performance. Can you say a little bit about the association with surrealism? Um, what is it that connects the ACI and the GPT to the surrealist automatism? Yeah, that's great. Um, and cheers to Andreas and apologies for not being able to get up in time to see your um, uh, keynote live. I look forward to seeing it, uh, the recorded version. And it's been a long time since we connected at Transmediale. So um, thanks for joining in and for your for your question. Uh, so we're trying to, uh, so we work with, uh, in addition to uh, the culture of spontaneity, we also work with, with remix culture too. And we're, we're seeing how in our experiments, especially with GPT-2, that it's pulling from a large corpus of, of text. And in a way, uh, you know, identifying patterns and establishing uh, itself as a as a kind of like automated remix engine that is uh, coming up with its uh, its creative outputs when we trigger it as such or weigh it as such one word at a time and uh, it's almost as if a lot of thought if you will doesn't go into that uh, that output process right you could say that about a GPT two a lot of thought does not go into it it's um, it's not controlled in that way, right? By by reason is is the quote that I pulled from, and it doesn't um, really focus on any particular aesthetic or or moral concern. And I found that uh, kind of titillating because um, as an artist, I don't necessarily want to uh, stop myself or censor myself from uh, allowing whatever is there, my unconscious creative potential to uh, manifest itself, to render itself into being. And so uh, I kind of uh, thought that the connection between my own generative uh, poetic outputs and what I thought of as pure psychic automatism, as you know, mentioned in the Surrealist Manifesto, related to the GPT-2 as well, because it, it wasn't thinking about what it was doing either it was just taking whatever language that it you know it happens to be uh modeling itself after and uh and turning it into uh the next version of creativity coming thank you very much uh we have another question the cartoon character daffy duck once famously sang you never know where you're going till you get there 
How important yeah. is not knowing where you're going in basic creativity? Uh, that's a beautiful question. Uh, it, in a way, for me, it's everything because it feeds into the uh, the discovery process, the 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 invention process. I've uh, I've never felt particularly comfortable uh, operating in reproduction mode or representation mode. I'm I'm always working in the abstract and looking into uh, into the future. And so, as part of this kind of like envisioning process or this this speculative digital fiction making process, the only way that I can uh, and I'm, I'm sort of riffing and remixing off something that the writer uh, E.L. Doctorow once said, uh, the only way to, for me to know what I'm going to make or to write is to make or write it. So I write to find out what I'm writing about. Thank you. Peter Nelson asks, would you be able to give a little more detail uh, on the relationship between the scripted uh, structure and the text bot, sorry if this is not the correct label, uh, the performance gave quite a coherent narrative structure as it moves through various ideas. Did this require careful scripting to stop the AI going too far off the rails or was this type of structure built into the generative system itself? So that's great. Um, so yeah, so the scripted part I mean, I, I maybe went off my own script uh, improvisationally. I, I give myself that leeway periodically throughout the performance, but I have a loose idea of where I'm going and the team does too. So we have this loose script that we're adhering to also because we, you know, we were trying to keep it within a particular time limit. Uh, as far as what the ACI contributed to the performance, I had no idea what it was going to say, but I, but I had a general idea of what the parameters were because we, like I was even saying, but it was kind of subtly in the presentation itself, uh, that it, it operates within a number of uh, state, state machines, of course, is what we call it. And uh, for me, state machines are all, almost like states of mind. And so they operate under various categories and, uh, and so within a particular uh, state machine, any number of potential performances by the ACI uh, can come out at any given time. And I, you know, and, and I imagine there are, you know, there's, a, there's a, a million versions of the way this could have turned out and they might've come, come out a little, um, little less uh, cohesive narratively speaking, or even theoretically, but in general, uh, I'm, I'm aware of what the potential uh, outputs of the ACI are, and I can uh, build my loose script around it and see what comes out. That becomes kind of like a, you know, a, like a structured improvisation is the way that musicians or dancers might refer to it. Uh, and in this particular, and so I, we've performed this a few times, and I would say, you know, seeing how things went and what was said by the ACI and how I was able to respond to it even very early in the morning here in Colorado, I would say that it, it, it really held together in a way that um, uh, that that was satisfying. And uh, and so, uh, I mean, I'm glad it came out that way. It, you know, the even, you know, and there, there we talk uh, in the lab, we often talk about these sort of happy accidents where you know, what the ACI says will feed right into what I'm somewhat loosely scripted to say. And it happened in, toward the end when it started, to, you know, slowly expressing a desire, which was the word it used, to really um, tap into its poetic uh, machinic state. And the, uh, the script, the loose script was leading toward uh, the final uh, poem, but there was no, there was no reason, uh, you know, it wasn't uh, programmed to go in that direction. And the fact that it did ended up being uh, a really nice outcome. So it, at the end, it was signaling it, a desire to uh, tap, tap more into its poetic side. And then the way things were set up, it, it just did it. And so that was, that was great. Good. Uh, we have a question by uh, this unconscious readiness potential that infuses my poetic thought process programmed 
to muse over my algorithmic self entrapment? Yeah, little things like that. <laughs> algorithmic self entrapment. That's an interesting poetic phrase of sorts. Sorry, please go on. Yes, Joanna uh, Zulinska asks, uh, thanks to Mark and the team uh, for this beautifully uncanny act. My question is about the fluidity and adapti adaptability of this model of art generation. To what extent does it need Mark America as the center, uh, the centered as it is uh, of its performance and delivery? Also, what becomes of the artist called Mark America in this act? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, we talk about that in the lab, too, because we really want this term ACI and the investigation into an artificial creative intelligence as a speculative form, both of AI, but also of digital fiction uh, to to work its way beyond myself. And so, you know, if we can use it just as, you know, I mean, right now, I'm it's, I like to say it's where the language artist and then in parentheses, Mark America meets the language model. And in this case, um, you know, as we further develop our research in the lab, it, it will be GPT-2 and GPT-3. So uh, yeah, so the language artist, uh, Mark America is definitely uh, in the mix here. There's no, no question about it. And, uh, and with the voice clones and whatnot that we're developing, uh, there'll be some consistency with what I consider this poetic sense of measure. But what it, you know, question asked is, and so I'll answer the, um, the question with a question since there really is no answer, um, at least no proper answer. Uh, you know, what does it mean to uh, evolve in an autoaffective embodied praxis as a poetic sense of measure. And is that something that is inherited? Uh, how does that relate to uh, the urge to remix, which is something that maybe not everybody thinks about in those uh, specifically in those terms, but as like a kind of creative evolution, what does it uh, mean to experience the urge to remix? And in that process, is that, um, more of a non-human automated um, behavioral attribute that uh, moves beyond the human per se and into other uh, forms of life, including artificial. And if so, then, uh, you know, is it possible that I'm really more like a, it's, it's just like a placeholder, you might say, that has, a, has its own kind of signature effect having evolved uh, a poetic sense of measure by experiencing experience, you know, over the course of, uh, of uh, like a, a cosmotechnical temporal uh, quality. Wonderful. Um, question uh, from Edward uh, Wedler. Uh, Peter McGraw's HURL, Humor Research Lab at University of Colorado deals with improvisational humor. What have you learned about improvisation in your work? Well, that's great. And uh, yeah, so we, um, that was one of the questions that the ACI asked in the midst of their performance as a research question, which was kind of interesting. What does it mean to share a sense of humor? So again, um, thinking about uh, the neuronal processing that takes place in both uh, creative expression, but also just in the way that we uh, choreograph our uh, our day to day lives and interactions socially with others, uh, humor plays a role in that. That's how you um, maybe feel more connected uh, to someone or something else. Uh, imp so the the improv. Uh, comedy troops that I'm sure many folks are aware of. They also, just like the jazz musicians, um, influence uh, our thought process in the lab. It's more than just you know having fun in the lab, but also 
uh, getting into you know what are the kind of like these collective uh, meta jam sessions, uh, which is what we kind of what we just did right now. And so when we're in the lab, uh, we selectively sample from different source material. And uh, oftentimes it could be uh, comedy. You know, like comedy is something that we turn to all the time. And just last night I was going through some of the, uh, some of the wonderful uh, stand-up uh, routines by George Carlin. Some of you may know George Carlin. And he, uh, he was, he was really on top of things. He was a language artist. I think he would have had lots of fun experimenting with uh, language models. That's what made him so, so great was the way that he could manipulate language. His was very scripted, of course, but he once, he once said that, uh, and it's, this relates to being sort of like an avant-garde artist. He said, uh, he said, yeah, um, avant-garde artists, they're, they're ahead of their time. And and I want to be ahead of my time too. I just want to be more than 30 minutes ahead of my time. Just kind of a funny line. But thanks for that question and for bringing up the University of Colorado. Go Buffs. Wonderful. Um, I think that's our last question for now. Uh, and uh, I think it's um, it kind of... Um, closes very well this uh, conversation that we had. Thank you very much for joining us today, uh, especially joining so early in the morning. <laughs> that wasn't very easy, but thank you very much for your flexibility. And uh, thank you to our uh, attendees 